and all you Southerners watching at home online. So, I know some of you cross-pollinate, but still, that's it. It's just, anyway, anyway. All right, starting a brand new series today uh, called Encountering God. And our, our basic premise in that is, this is we tend to form an image, a picture of what we expect God to do and how we expect him to be. And a lot of the time, we will then encounter God in a real way that doesn't match with our expectations, that doesn't match with the box we want to keep God in, and will frequently reject the reality of God in favor of our box or our preconception or our image that we've created. And we're going to be going through a lot of the Gospel of John and a little bit of Luke too, as we go and look at people who literally are encountering God in Jesus Christ and we'll see how they respond to him, how he treats them, and we'll be learning about how we should be responding when we authentically encounter God. And so when we can, I can actually identify when we're encountering God and when we're not encountering God. So if you want to, turn in your Bibles or turn on your Bible to John chapter 4. You can use the Bible app to get the notes and pull them up, however you electronically or paper-wise want to do that. We're going to be spending our time in John chapter 4 today. Uh, many of you know this story. If you've been a, a, a church person for a long time, John 4, it's the woman at the well. And we'll, we'll be digging into that today. John 4, starting in verse 4. He, that's Jesus, had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. A bunch of Old Testament stories here. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. Now, let me tell you what that means. Um, anybody here, now some of you may have been there. Some of you, have, have any of you been, ever been to Fort Bragg? A couple, couple of you know the general concept of where that's at, right? And if you wanted to get from here to Fort Bragg, how would you do that? You go, go out, you get on 87, you go south, what is that, eight or nine miles, something like that. Go right through Spring Lake, and as soon as you get through Spring Lake, there is Fort Bragg. And it's really easy to get there. Um, but I was trying to think, is there another way to get there? Let's say just, Spring Lake was off limits to you. There was a warrant for your arrest in Spring Lake. So you had to go around Spring Lake. And so, I, I know, too, too close to home for a couple of you. But uh, I'm thinking, the, the, only, the, the, one of the one of the ways I can think of, the only real good one I can think of, is you, you go to Lillington, and Lillington's about 15 miles, something like that, east of here, and then you get on 401, and 401 would take you south to Ramsey Street in Fayetteville, which is like, like on the wrong side of Fayetteville, so then you'd go across Fayetteville all the way to get to Fort Bragg, right? And you would basically never consider doing that, like I said, unless there's a warrant for your, okay, when the Jews wanted to go from Jerusalem, the capital city, to um, Galilee, where Jesus did a lot of his ministry up in here, the middle part was Samaria. They would, quite, not quite accurately, go to Fort Bragg through Lillington rather than go through their spring lake, which is Samaria. Now, remember... They were walking, and they would go to Lillington and head south to get to where they were going rather than go through Samaria, go through Spring Lake. Why? Samaria, this is shocking, was full of Samaritans. And they really, 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 really didn't like Samaritans. And they would go that far out of their way. So the fact that Jesus cuts through there is a big deal. And so when the woman sees him there, not only did he come into Samaria, he stopped in the middle of Samaria, and now he's talking to A, a woman, and B, a woman that, as we'll see in a little bit, probably shouldn't talk to. And he comes all the way into Samaria. And the, the, the things I want you to see is this. One of the first ones I want you to see is when God wants an encounter with us, when we have an encounter, that Jesus comes to us where we are. 
Jesus comes to us where we are. Now, we're used to that. We've kind of gotten bored with that. But the reality is, the Bible says that the word, which is Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay? And then, to help you understand how far a trip it was from God to us, Philippians 2.7 says that Jesus emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. The gap between God and us is incredible. And we know that God took on human flesh and all the pain and junk and everything else that there was to come to us. Now, we have a bad habit of minimizing that distance. As, as we, t- you know, because, well, let, let's be honest. See, um, there are different kinds of people, right? And there are the people who are really far from God and I'm sure for Jesus to get to them, that was a long way. But, you know, <laughs> then there's us good church people, right? And I don't know about you, but I have learned to eliminate those sins from my life that other people can see. Right? Anybody else on there that you're really, really good? Any sin that others can actually look at and tell that you're doing, I have gotten really good at making sure that those aren't there anymore. And actually, some of the ones that you can't see, I've gotten rid of even, I've even gotten rid of some of those. And somehow I have the idea that I have made the trip for God to get to me less. That I have shortened the gap between me and God so that now when God comes to me personally, as a follower of Christ, it's not as big a deal that God came to Steve because I'm a pretty good guy got a lot going for me yeah bible says things like in me there's no good thing lives inside of me that that my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked it says stuff like that and it's kind of like this if you say well am i closer to god than i used to be well yes so i guess i have lowered the gap some but let's talk about how much i've lowered the gap let's say i want to go to the moon Now, if I was going to go to the moon, would I be better off leaving from here at Spout Springs or from Fayetteville? Hmm? Well, I mean, if I'm not if I'm if I'm accurate in the way that it feels when I'm leaving Spring Lake, it feels like I'm going up the whole way, right? I'd bet I am here in Spout Springs, I am probably, I'm just guessing here, three, maybe four hundred feet higher than Fayetteville. Does that sound about right? About three, 400 feet? I might, be, I might be exaggerating, but I think that's about right. Which means when it comes to going from the earth to the moon, if I start in Spout Springs, I am 400 feet ahead of the person who starts from Fayetteville. So obviously, I am much closer to the moon here than they are, based on the hundreds of thousands of miles that it is from here. Oh, Wait a second. Here to the moon, minus 400 feet. Not so much, huh? And here we are as people who are fallible, screwed up humans. And we sometimes, as as you've been working on it for years, you start thinking, man, I have made some progress and God doesn't need to reach down as far to reach me now because I'm really good. And the reality is God has to go that much closer. When God reaches to you, he is reaching a long way. When God reaches to where you are, he is making a big, big jump. Does that make sense? Keep that in mind because here's what you do what I do here 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 I start because I'm here I judge the people who are here right <laughs> you do that I'm here I judge the people that are here because I'm so much <sighs> no room for that is there all sin falls short of the glory of God doesn't matter whether you're in Spout Springs or Fayetteville it's a it's a long way to the moon and you have that. So when God comes to us, recognize that's a big deal. But that's not the only thing he does. Let's look at, kids keep reading. 
uh, back in John, verse, second part of verse 9. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Um, she takes his size. Sir, I don't want to be insolent or anything. You don't have a rope or a bucket. And this well is very deep. Where would you get the living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestors? Let's change the subject, she says. And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? So Jesus twists things around again. Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them giving them eternal life. And she misses the eternal life part and comes back with, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water because it's a pain to get water. You've got to walk a long way in the heat. You've got to carry the heavy stuff back. And I don't want to do that anymore, so give me the water. And she totally missed what he was talking about. So he decides to be very nice and polite with her. Jesus decides to, 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 you know, to make sure that, that she likes him, so he says something that will, will make her feel good about herself. And she says, go and get your husband, Jesus said. Husband? Did you say, go get my husband? Yes. Um, I, 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 I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. And they're talking about your backhand compliment. <laughs> Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So now let's change the subject. So tell me, because I don't want to talk about the fact that I've had all this sin in my life. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it's here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? What about my religion versus your religion? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes to the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know Messiah is coming, the one who's called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, okay. I am the Messiah. Now, I want you to see that. We first we said that Jesus comes to us where we are. I want you to notice with this woman, Jesus comes to us as we are. Do you ever wonder, some of you know this, why she came at noon to draw water? You ever think about that for a second? Because you ever seen a picture of the Middle East? You ever been to the Middle East? From the, I've never been to the Middle East, but from the pictures... If I'm doing anything that involves, I don't know, working outside, do you know what I'm not going to try to do it? Noon. All right, if, it's, if it's a one-time task, I will take my you know, schedule my day so that that gets done first thing in the morning or last thing at night. Right? I am not going to go, car you ever carried water? You ever, water, water comes in heavy. Okay, that's how it works. And you've got to car carry it careful because if you splosh it out, you just wasted the trip. So you're, I'm not doing, why is she doing this at noon? It has to do with those five husbands and that guy she's living with now and all that other stuff. You know what happened when she would go in the regular part of the morning? All the good women. <laughs> she didn't like the shame. Now here's the thing. Jews wouldn't associate with good Samaritans and good Samaritans wouldn't associate with her. And Jesus came to her as she was. And the word we're looking for here is she was a sinner. One of, my, one of the most powerful verses in the Bible when you stop and think about it is Romans 5.8. It says, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, let's remind ourselves, what is a sin? Oh, sin is you do something bad. Not exactly. 
Sin is anything we do that violates God's nature, anything that would be offensive to God. One time I told a story, and I used the illustration, the concept that if somebody were to come to your house and clip their toenails in your living room, you would find that offensive, right? Well, sin is any time we clip our toenails in God's living room. When we do anything that he would find offensive, that's what a sin is. Sin is doing things that are snubbing our nose at God and saying, God, I don't need your standards. I don't need your regulations. I'm ignoring you. Neener, neener, neener. I'm going to do what I want. And the Bible says that while we're doing that, while we're snubbing our nose at God, while we're intentionally doing things that offend in him and violate his nature, that's when Jesus died for us. I've used the illustration before also that if you could remember, just if you just stop for a second and try to remember the thing in your life you're most embarrassed about. The action that you've done that if I were to say, guess what, we have managed to, to we can put these electrodes on your head and if you'll think about the most embarrassing thing you've ever done, most embarrassing wrong thing, and we're going to show the video on the screen right now. Okay. If, 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 if you can imagine that moment and how terrible it would be to show that, that's the moment Christ died for you. In the middle of the most heinous thing you've ever done, Christ died for you. So Jesus comes to us as we are, as sinners. I'm kind of glad he didn't wait till I got myself cleaned up to come for me. Because I have practice in cleaning myself up. It is not one of my strengths. I am not really good at fixing myself. I'm not very good at turning over new leaves. When I turn over a new leaf, I just find another leaf underneath it. It's just as bad. So I'm glad he comes to me as I am. But here's the other thing, too. Not only was she a sinner who was, he was coming to her as she were as a sinner, he came to her not only while she was still a sinner, he came to her while she was still clueless. Did you notice she didn't get anything he said? He'd talk about living water and she'd think about a creek. He'd talk about Messiah, and she'd think about a mountain. He'd talk about worship, and she'd be talking about a building. Can I tell you something It's important? When Jesus comes to us as we are, he always points us to himself. Right? Can I tell you what that means? Because, like I said at the beginning, we have a tendency to have the image of God that we've created for ourselves. And when God appears to us, we then try to fit God into that box. And if he doesn't fit, what we do is we reject the real revelation of God in favor of our box. Let me give you a couple things that we'll do sometimes when we're trying to su substitute for God. The first one, which she brings up, is some sort of an empty religion. Because what we're wanting is some sort of rituals or ceremonies. Because encountering God, as she shows you, can be very uncomfortable. And when she comes to that, we'll say, okay, well then, I'll start going to church. And I, th I think that's a good thing. I do that every week myself. Even if it's snowing, I'll come to church. Even if it's snowing, I'll come to church. <laughs> I, just saying. But here's the thing, the goal isn't to come to church. Church can be a means to a goal, matter of fact it is a means to a goal, but it can never be the goal. Any ritual, anything you do that's just an action that doesn't lead you closer to God is just a ritual. Now somebody said, well Steve, I'm glad I go to a church and we don't have any rituals. I like, I like to go to a church with no, we have rituals, they're just different. They're just newer rituals. I mean, you know how, if you've been here very long, you know how a church service is going to go, don't you? Some of you guys depend on it. Because you know when the sermon's going to start, and that's when you show up. Right? Ah! I mean, I, I, I come to both services, and I, I get over here just in, in time for the greeting time, basically. And there are people I beat here. 
okay? And so we, you know how there's rituals. We sing these kind of songs. We have this thing in the middle where Barry gets up and gives a vision statement, you know, vision testimony thing, and we have an offering, and then I, I speak, and then we'll do a blue bag thing at the end. And we'll, We got rituals. They're just different. And the rituals can be a way to get you to God, but the rituals themselves are never valuable. And we tend to substitute, when we come up on something and we get confronted with God, we tend to want to go for the ritual. Or, let's get meaner. Or, we come to it for the warm fuzzy. And we're looking at something that is really just empty spirituality. Matter of fact, you're going to... Well, there are people I know and can fall into this myself. I judge everything based on whether or not I leave with a warm fuzzy. How was church today? I felt so good. How was your quiet time today? How was your personal worship? How'd it go when you're reading the Bible and praying on your own today? Oh, God just blessed me. I just felt so warm and fuzzy. You know what I found? While encountering God often brings me joy, it very rarely brings me warm fuzzies. You know what encountering God usually brings to me? When I'm reading the Bible and God really speaks to me out of, the, out of scriptures, one of two things happens, or both. One, I get convicted, or two, I get confused. Notice that's what happened to this woman. She spent the whole thing confused. She's encountering God, and everything is going over her head. When I was um, in college, my, my last year undergraduate, there were four of us that rented an apartment together, and I consider myself a humorous person. I can, I can make people laugh. I, 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 I was in an apartment with four people, and two of them were funnier than me, and I don't give that up easy. Okay, I, I was, no, I don't, that two were funnier than me, and there was me, and there was our other roommate, Terry, who never got a single joke any of us told. He spent an entire year going, whew, 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 everything went over. Matter of fact, he's bald now from all the jokes that just went just barely over his head. Because he missed everything. And you'll notice this woman, when she was talking to Jesus, she missed everything he said. He talks about water. She thinks he's talking about real water. He's talking about spiritual water. She's talking about, you notice, she missed it all. Jesus is trying, he's bringing it down to her level, and she's still missing it. You know what I found? There's two things I look for, like I said, when I'm reading the Bible for God to speak to me. Well, number one is, does it convict me? Does it make me feel guilty about something that God, that, where my life doesn't match up with what God wants? And the second thing I look to, for is, does it confuse me? When I'm reading through the Bible, and I read a verse, or I read a, a, a word even, and, the word, and I go, that's weird. Why is that there? God is usually speaking through this point of my confusion. And he's wanting me to dig in there. Anytime I'm reading the Bible, I get confused. I consider it a big X on a, on a treasure map. Huh, wonder what that means. I guess I should figure it out. And I start praying and I start digging. And let me, let me just put this to you. A number of the sermons I preach in a given year come out of my journals. And an awful lot of them come from when I'm reading the Bible by myself and I get confused. And when I dig in and figure out the confusion and start reconciling my life with God, that's where some really cool messages come from. Okay? See, a lot of us have this thing. We've substituted an empty religious ritual or we've substituted warm fuzzies for God. But the encounter with God rarely looks like that. Can I tell you something? Can I be really honest with you? There are plenty of people out there who have found this wonderful crystal thing they bought on the internet that has an amazing spiritual resonance, and when they hold it, they feel warm and fuzzy, and they're nowhere near God. So if you're basing your faith and your spirituality on the fact whether or not when you get up in the morning and you read the Bible, you leave feeling warm and fuzzy, you're substituting something else for Jesus Christ. Now, when I take the confusion and when I take the conviction and I move toward God... That's where joy shows up, which is a whole lot better than a warm fuzzy. Are we, are we clear? Aren't you glad you came? So, Jesus comes to us where we are. He comes to us as we are. And let's get back to, to, to John 4. I just, do? just then his disciples came back. Now, where have his disciples been? In Sychar. They've been in the town. It's important to know that. 
they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, well, what do you want with her, or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming out of the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. And here, now notice, the disciples are encountering God, and they're not getting it either. Okay? They, verse 33, did someone bring him food while, while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Did he have a cliff bar stuffed in his robe something? Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. The fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get the, gather the harvest. Now here's where it gets really difficult. It's because we said Jesus reaches us where we are, Jesus reaches us as we are, and then he challenges us to approach others the same way. See, Jesus is pushing us past our selfish faith to active involvement in people's lives. And, well, I've been, I haven't been that mean this morning, so let me, let me take it up a notch. One of my favorite things, and by favorite I mean things that I hate most about Christianity and Christians is when somebody comes to me and tells me this or sends word to me this and says, Steve, I just need more, I need to be fed more. I need more meat in the teaching. I, you, you, you get that. You get that a lot if you're in my line of work. That's an excuse people have so they can change churches and hear somebody tell them what they want to hear. Because here's what Jesus said. Did you notice what Jesus said when they came to him and said something about nutrition? He said, he said his, his first words were, my nourishment coming, comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. In other words, my food, my nutrition, my meat, as the King James puts it there, comes from doing God's will. My meat comes from obedience. Another thing that will substitute for God in an active relationship with God is busy stuff. Now, I think everybody should be in a connection group. One or two connection groups, probably just one, but maybe two connection groups. But I know people who have substituted connection groups for obedience. They're so busy learning minutia about the Bible and about God and about psychology and about anything else somebody will write a book about, but they're not doing anything to go where people are to obey what God wants them to do. And they're coming to us saying, oh, I'm not getting fed. You're not feeding yourself because you're not obeying what God wants you to do. What God wants you to do, well, Philippians 2, 5 through 8 we already read the start about emptying himself. Let's get the attitude right. Make your attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come, to a, come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What am I saying? I'm saying... What God wants us to do, one of the big things, is the same way that Jesus comes to us where we are, God wants us to go to people where they are. And the same way that Jesus comes to us as we are, he wants to go, us to go to people as they are. If all you ever do is hang around other Christians, how in the world are you going to reach people where they are? I don't know, where could you possibly run into people who are far from God? Hmm. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but as I was leaving my neighborhood this morning, when I was pulling out to come to church, there was a policeman positioned at the exit to our subdivision to direct the traffic. Because everybody in the subdivision is getting up and coming to church this morning. They're going to different churches. But man, it's a traffic jam in my neighborhood when it's coming. Sunday morning is like, it is so hard. Is it like, is that like for you? Is it hard to get out of your neighborhood? Do you have to like plan in advance to get out of your neighborhood to get to church in the morning? Do you, I mean, I mean, do, you, do you have to like give yourself an extra 10, 15 minutes just to clear? I mean, if you live in Carolina Lakes, I bet it's terrible. Getting through the gate? Wow. Oh, it's not like that at your neighborhood? Yeah, there were two of us leaving this morning. 
I have the distinct impression, and you could tell me that I'm wrong, but I have the distinct impression that you live in a neighborhood with people who are far from God. Which means God has already placed you where they are. The only question is, are you trying to interact with them where they are? Ooh, I got grunts on that one. That's good. One of the things that our, um, one of our ministries is, is doing, they're, they're creating packets to help us at Easter. So you can throw a little, they're going to give you all the stuff you need to throw a little Easter egg hunt in your little, just in your little neighborhood, on your street. Sort of learning from what we learned in Cambodia, how to reach, reach kids and stuff. And so you just throw an Easter egg hunt right before Christmas on your street, and you can invite all your people to church. I think it's kind of cool, because it's going where you are. But it's not just going where you are, it's going to them as they are. And, and I'm not going to sound very Christian right now, but I'm not real good at sounding Christian anyway, so I'm not concerned. Some Christians I know need to recalibrate their offense meter. What I mean is this. An awful lot of Christians are offended by everything that people who are far from God do. And they can't go hang around somebody who's far from God because they're going to offend them. I don't like to hang around them. They use bad words. Oh, wouldn't want somebody far from God to act like they're far from God. That would be wrong. They talk about things I don't like. I'm not comfortable with how they talk about what the things they talk about. I don't like to hang around people who are far from God because they talk about things that I, I don't like to talk about and they use words that I don't like to hear. So I try to say them because, as we all know, the reason Jesus came was to make us comfortable. Oh yeah, I forgot. Can I point this out to you? If you're looking for a religion to make you comfortable you probably shouldn't be looking at one whose leader died on a cross. Okay? God calls us to be, un how do you think Jesus felt at that well with that woman? Do you think he was comfortable? Are you crazy? This person lives so far from his will. It's a hot, nasty day. He's tired. The Bible says he was really, really tired. That's why he stayed there. He placed himself in an area of discomfort and then he reached the people who were right there even though they made him uncomfortable. So let's, let's, keep, let's finish up this story. It says next, verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came to see him, they begged him to stay at their village. So he stayed for two days long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. And so make sure, make sure this, as you're reaching these people, make sure you're bringing them to Jesus. And that's just a side note. If you're bringing them to that same warm fuzzy stuff we were talking about or those empty rituals, it's not gonna help. But I, I want you to see one other thing. Okay. How many disciples were with Jesus? I don't know either. <laughs> could, could, it could have been just the 12. It could have been an expanded number. It doesn't actually say that I've noticed. Where did they go while well, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well? They went into the town. They went into Sychar. Here, wait, 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 wait. This is cool. How many people did they bring back with them from Sychar? None. Absolutely nobody came back. They went into the city, they got their stuff, and they got back out, and they had absolutely zero impact. And then the woman who'd lost track of her marriages, the woman who was confused and was just figuring out the whole Jesus thing, went into the city and she brought everybody back. She brought every, some of you guys are going, oh, Steve, I could never accomplish that. I could never be somebody who helps people come to a relationship with Christ. I could never invite people to church. I could never do any of those things you're talking about because look at my life, look at what my past looks like. Disciples, zero 
Samaritans, woman at the well, the whole town. Because she was bringing them to Jesus. And it's important that you recognize you're, it's not about making them like you. Well, that doesn't hurt. It's about bringing them to Jesus. It's not, a, it's not about getting them on a church roll. Matter of fact, you, you'll run to somebody and you'll say, you ask them, here's one of your cop-out things. Do you go to church? And they say, yeah. And you go, good. Maybe. You can come to this church and not be a Christian. Matter of fact, we kind of think we always want to have people who aren't Christians here at this church. It's one of our goals. You can go to any church and not be a Christian. Are you pointing them to Jesus? Jesus is real clear about this. In a, in, when he was talking to the woman, in verses 25 and 26, the woman said, I know Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus said to her, I am the Messiah. Now, we don't get the impact of what he just said. Because he just, he just slapped her in the face with truth in a way that we don't get. Because the, the, first thing, the first two words were what? I am the Messiah. Now, here's, so you can feel like you learned something deep. The Greek for I am there is ego a me. Okay, ego a me. Ego is the word for I. It's a very strong word. A me means am. In Greek, though, you don't need the word ego. You can just say a me and it means I am. If you put the word ego, if you put the strong I, that is an incredibly strong statement. I am. Now, how strong? Well, you may have heard of a guy named Moses. And there, there's this dude named Moses, and he's a shepherd in the wilderness, and God wants to call him to go back to Egypt to bring all the people out. You saw the movie, right? Or the cartoon. The cartoon was really good, too. And God gets this bush that's burning and doesn't ever burn up, and so Moses comes over to the bush, and God says, I want you to go back to Egypt. And Moses says, I can't. And God slaps him around a little bit. And finally Moses says, okay, if, if let's say I go, who will I say sent me? What's your name, God? And God says, I am. That's where we get the word Yahweh or Jehovah, I am. That's where that, that's a direct, just I am. So, well, yeah, but people say I am all the time. You, you really think when Jesus said I am, anybody would think, well, he uses that word, that phrase at least one other time. And there's a time in the Gospels when he's talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all kinds of stuff. He's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, before Abraham was, I am. Ego a me. You know what the Pharisees do when he says that? They pick up rocks to stone him to death because it was blasphemy. He just claimed to be Yahweh. He just claimed to be Jehovah. He claimed to be God. And the Pharisees understood it, grabbed rocks, and went to stone him to death. He talks to this woman, and he says, I am Yahweh. I am God. I am the Messiah. I am. Now, there's no compromising that. There's no partializing that. There's no saying, okay, well, if you just come to church, that's good enough. No, we are called to come to Jesus, and we are called to bring others to Jesus. Does that make sense? And we substitute playing church. We substitute being good moral people. It's a shame. You know, if, in most of the, at least in, in the, parts places that I've lived a lot if you say someone's a good Christian what does that mean it means they don't break the Ten Commandments that often at least not the ones you can see right a good Christian for most people is someone who's moral was Jesus a good Christian <laughs> yeah what did he do he went to people where they were he went to people as they were, and he brought them to himself. And if you want to be a good Christian, and I'm not saying you need to get a big Bible and go down your street and beat people over the head with the Bible and put a bunch of bumper stickers on your car that tell them they're going to hell, and it's not really what he did. I think you notice he just engaged in conversations, went where they were, went to them as they were, talked to them that way. That's what he's calling you to do. Now, of course, that won't work if you don't have a relationship with Christ, obviously. And if you're, you're missing that, if, if, if you're in the place where maybe you've substituted religion for that, you've substituted warm fuzzies for that, or maybe you're just still trying to figure everything out, if you're ready for a relationship with Christ, all we ask you to do is to grab one of these blue bags. There's some on both sides of the platform. There's some back there on the bookshelf. And you grab a blue bag, 
We'll connect you with somebody who's trained. They'll take about 10 minutes. They'll walk you through the contents of the bag and show you how to have that relationship with Christ. Not, not a relationship with this image you created of yourself, but God in Jesus Christ. If you have that relationship, we say the next step, the Bible says the next step is to be baptized. If you're already baptized, let us know. We do that the first Wednesday of every month. Um, could be that you just want to reconnect with what Christ did for you to remind yourself that it's not about empty use rituals. And one of the things is he gives us rituals that have power and meaning if we live them right. And one of them is communion. If you want to take communion, we have a communion station set up here in the front, one in the back. And if there's anything you want to pray about, we have a cross over there and the purpose of that is for you to pray about. It could be what we talked about in the sermon. It could be something totally unrelated that God's just working in your heart or something that bothers you and concerns you. We've got a cross over to pray at. We've also got some people who are willing to pray with you. If you'd like to pray with somebody, just approach them and say, would you pray with me about whatever it is, they'll be glad to pray with you. We create an image of God that is completely empty. It can't provide us with peace. It can't provide us with joy. It can't help us transform our lives. But God wants to come into your life. God wants to move in your life. God wants to come into your life where you are. He wants to come into your life as you are. And he wants to bring you closer to himself. If you have substituted anything else for that kind of faith, it's time to go back to the real thing. It's time to ditch the fake and go back to the real. Because as we'll see next week, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And that fullness isn't found in warm fuzzies. It isn't found in empty rituals. It's only found in Jesus. Would you stand with us?